Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call Finance, Ways, and Means Committee to order for March 7th, 2023. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Representatives Barrett, Boyd, Campbell, Camper, Cochran, Crawford, Faison, Freeman, Gant, Garrett, Hawk, Hicks, Keesling, Lamberth, Love, Lynn, McKenzie, Miller, Moon, Parkinson, Shaw, Sparks, Whitson, Williams, Zachary, Vice Chairman Baum, Chair Lady Hazelwood. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Do we have any personal orders or announcements? Chairman Keesling, you're recognized. Th thank you, Madam Chair. And I would be remiss, uh, before they leave, I want, there's there's three ladies out here in the audience, and they're smiling right now. I want them to each stand. Please stand with you. These these ladies just called on us. They have, uh, they're from UT. Uh, they're here their day on the Hill, Student Government Affairs. Let's give them a warm welcome, please. <laughs> thank you, Chair Lady. Thank you. Are there any other personal orders, announcements? Seeing none, uh, today we've got two budget hearings scheduled and we have 16 bills on our calendar. We're going to take the bills up first so that members can get on to their other respective duties and then we'll um, immediately commence with budget hearings. So we are in session and the item number one on our calendar is House Bill 130 by Deputy Speaker Johnson and his... Hang on just a second. He's asked to roll that bill one week. Um, <laughs> that brings us to item number two, House Bill 144 by Leader Lambert. Uh, <laughs> I know I saw him. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Do we have a motion on House Bill 144? have a motion and a second. Madam Chairman, this is a straightforward bill. It requires for um, scram units on DUI third offenses and allows for inpatient treatment at 17 days if someone is convicted of a DUI second offense. And I do believe there's an amendment on the bill. Is that correct? There is. should be amendment coded 4232. That's what I have. So I have a motion. We have a motion and a second on the amendment. All in favor of adding the amendment to House Bill 144, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? You guys have it, and the amendment is now attached. And Leader Lambert, do you have any more information you'd like to share about the bill? No, Madam, 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 Madam Chairman, only that the amendment uh, takes these particular individuals that, again, are DUI third or subsequent out of eligibility for the Electronic Monitoring Indigency Fund, which I know is an issue that is near your heart and mine as well. All right. Any questions for Leader Lambert? Chairman Williams. Thank you, Thank you Chair Lady. Leader, didn't... Um, uh, didn't expect to ask this question when I walked in the door, but a uh, quick question. Has there ever been any consideration in regards to this law uh, as it being a truth and sentencing portion of the statute, which would require someone to serve 100% of their sentence as it relates to a, a DUI after the second? Leader Lambert, sorry, you caught me in mid okay. So vehicular homicides, assaults, we definitely have had that conversation. DUI first, second, and third in the state of Tennessee are all misdemeanors. And so truth and sentencing, normally those fall outside of that category. Now, when you go fourth or subsequent, um, definitely I think that is a conversation that needs to be had. Um, we have this body, when I first got elected 10 years ago, and you remember this vividly, we, we had fourth or subsequent. It never got worse than a fourth, which was an E felony, which meant most folks did two years at 30%. They were out in 216, 17 days on determinate release. This body increased that on a DUI fifth to a D felony, two to four years, and on a sixth or subsequent, which just happens more often than you would imagine, um, on, as a C felony, which is three to six years. Um, a significant increase and kind of tripled the amount of time. Now, those offenses, you know, actually falling under truth and sentencing, I think is a, definitely a healthy conversation to have. Chairman Lee, should I follow thank, up? thank you. I just, uh, I think it's important for us to take a look at some additional avenues by which we can continue to make sure that we penalize those multiple offenders as it relates to certain entities. I understand now, thank you for answering your question as it relates to misdemeanors, but a uh, 
it may be a great discussion for us to have as it relates to those felonious ones. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we're now voting on House Bill 144. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 144 moves to calendar and rules. Leader Lambert, you have the next item on our agenda as well. House Bill 805. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And this is the do not text bill. Are we, do we have a motion? We have a motion and a second. So, Leader Lambert, you, would you like to elucidate further? Yes, this is the do not text bill. It just adds into the do not call list, text message communications. All right, you've heard the sponsor's explanation. We do have an amendment, drafting code 004765. We have a motion. We have a second on the amendment. All in favor of adding amendment 004765, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, Any opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment is attached. And does the amendment make any significant changes to the explanation you already gave us, Leader Lambert? No significant changes, Madam Chairman. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're voting on House Bill 805. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 805 moves on to calendar and rules. The next item on our agenda is... Chairman Haston, House Bill 68. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Haston, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, glad to carry this bill for the administration. Uh, in, in 2021, uh, we passed the Tennessee Learning Loss Remediation and Student Acceleration Act. The act only required summer learning camps and after school learning camps for the summers of 2021 and 2022 for students entering first through fifth grades and grades six through eight. This bill extends all camps indefinitely, plus adds students entering kindergarten to participate in summer learning camps and mini camps as well. With that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. You've heard the sponsor's explanation. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Representative McKenzie, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, uh, uh, thank you for uh, this, this bill. D does this bill cover any of the transportation and let's call it food costs associated with these camps? Chairman Haston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I believe that the transportation and food, um, and we've had this discussion a little bit about TANF funds uh, that came up also in subcommittee. Some of the TANF funds will be used, but it would still have to be annually approved uh, the, through the same process that they were initially approved uh, for the, uh, the bridge camps as they currently exist. Uh, and Chairman Haston, the program originally, I believe you said, was three through, go through the ages that are covered again, please. It was originally first through uh, fifth grades and then uh, uh, sixth through eighth. Uh, it also adds uh, incoming ninth graders as well in, in this legislation. I mentioned kindergartners, but also incoming ninth graders. So we've extended it one year on, on either end. Yes. I, I see no further questions, so we're voting. Um, Chairman Hicks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Chairman, just to make sure, so for the learning loss camps for this year, so grades K through three, will that be implemented this year? Chairman Hayson. For 21-22, it was one through five and six through eight. Uh, this bill would make sure that it extends out and definitely those current grades, but also add incoming ninth grade and kindergarten as well going to the future. Uh, if I have that wrong, I think we've got the department down to, to testify if I have that incorrect, they can come up and make sure I have that correct. But I think that that is right. See, I'm, I'm still a little bit confused on whether or not those grades one through three are going to be having those camps this year, because my understanding they weren't. So does this mean now they are? And if now they are, then when does it begin? Because I can tell you LEAs right now have no idea. So if, if would you like to go out of session, have um, Chairman Hicks have education come up? Chairman Hayson? I believe that currently they would be able to do that one through three. If I'm incorrect on that, you can go out of session, but I'm pretty sure that that's accurate. Let's go out of session. We'll ask the department to come forward.
Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair Lady. Uh, my name is Reed Cook, the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Department of Education. Lisa Coons, Chief Academic Officer. Mary Ann Dursky, Chief Financial Officer. And Chairman Hicks, would you like to redirect your question to these fine folks? Absolutely. Thank you all for being here. So uh, the question is, just, just for clarity's sake, what learning loss camps are going to be implemented this coming summer? And then it, does this bill do that? Or what exactly does this bill do as far as funding? So the application for rising four through eight is in process and being released to districts in the next few weeks. This bill would add rising K through three and rising ninth grader for this summer. And we are prepared to roll that out. So districts have plenty of time to plan for that. Chairman Hicks. Perfect. But I, yeah, I can't stress enough. Boy, it'd be good to start getting that out to school districts so that they know. So thank you. Any further questions while we're out of session? Leader Lambert. Mr. Chairman, I, I think you just did, and I'm glad that you asked that question because I agree. It is something that I hope the department, while we have you up here, is communicating. I know you said the next few weeks, but this bill is moving through the, the system rather rapidly, and that's a good thing. It's going to do a lot of good. I appreciate the sponsor carrying it, but I, I hope this is something that we are communicating very quickly to the school systems so that they are ready to do this. It's going to help a lot of kids, but only if it's rolled out well. So I just say that while you're there, and, uh, and please follow up on that sage advice from the chairman. I would just add an amen to that, not only the school system, but I think parents need to know as quickly as possible that that's an option for their children because we all know how fast summer programming and summer childcare gets booked. So I think it would be incredibly helpful for parents to be sure that they're aware that this option is going to be there. Representative Love, I believe you had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just for clarity on the partnerships that are available with these summer camps, are nonprofit organizations allowed to partner with the LEAs to carry these out, or is it just going to be the LEAs? I think LEAs across the state have shown us for the past two years that they have strong partnerships with their nonprofits and have that access. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lady. Are there further questions for the department? Representative Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lady. I was just reading where um, state receives approximately $182 million annually. Um, and am I understanding this right? The proposed legislation will draw upon existing federal TANF dollars in the amount of $13 million uh, for FY23-24. Are those recurring amounts of dollars? We would have to um, request those dollars every year, but we have every reason to believe that they will be appropriate for this purpose annually. Would this be the very first time that the department has requested any TANF dollars in, in, the, in the past? We have used TANF dollars in both of the preceding summers to supplement the cost of the camps, yes. But prior to the cost of the camps, have, have the department ever requested any funding from TANF dollars, if, if you understand my question. Okay, outside of the camps, that I don't know, but I would be happy to look into that and get an answer back to this committee. Okay, but thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Seeing none, we're back in session. And with that good discussion, are there any other questions for the sponsor? Seeing none. We'll be voting on House Bill 68. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 68 moves on to calendar and rules. Thank, Thank you, you Chairman Chair Hasten. Chairman Holsclaw, have House Bill 145, agenda item number five. Motion. We have a motion and a second. Chairman Holsclaw, you're recognized. <laughs> <laughs> that guy before we a little taller than I was. HB 145 is a sec Secretary of State bill, and basically it's a continuation and extends a period of reduced fees for charitable gaming. 
And with that, I renew my motion. Right, you've heard the sponsor's explanation. And um, as a clarifying point, the Secretary of State will be using um, their reserve dollars to um, offset these costs. So yes. it is funded. Should have a letter forward to you. Any questions for Chairman Hosclaw? Seeing none, we're voting on House Bill 145. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 145 goes on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Committee. House Bill 54 by Chairman Powers. Chairman Powers. Thanks. We have a motion and a second. You are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, House Bill 54 is an administration securities update bill. Uh, this legislation includes investor opportunities and efficiencies for capital formation and increases investor protection. The security of citizens' private and personal financial information is enhanced by making the examination records confidential, and it deletes the filing fee and requirements for employee stock option offerings in Tennessee that meet the requirements of Rule 701 of the regulations under the Securities Act of 1933 and increases the capital that can be raised under the Investment Tennessee exemption from $1 million to $5 million. And with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. Uh, and I do believe, Mr. Chairman, I'm showing a, an amendment on the bill. Yes, you are correct. Let me find drafting, that amendment. Sorry. The drafting code we have is 4538. What was the number you had, the code? 4538. Why do I have a different number? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> three nine two two. Yes, four five three eight. You are correct. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, would you care to tell us what the amendment does? Uh, the amendment makes the bill. <laughs> no, <it doesn't. laughs> well, I'm glad we got that done. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> So uh, it's just a technical <laughs> correction. <laughs> so the amendment is on the bill. The amendment does make the bill. You've heard the sponsor's explanation of the bill as amended. Are there any questions? All right, I'm not sure. I thought we adopted the amendment, but my brain trust here says maybe we didn't actually get that done okay. with all the levity. So House Bill 004538, I know I heard a motion and a second. We're now voting on that. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative McKenzie, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, and, and, and my question is, I, I like a, almost all of the elements of this uh, a bill other than the, um, the transparency piece of it uh, uh, and, and, and trying to, uh, I definitely understand trying to protect the uh, investors, you know, uh, uh, information, but, but, but whenever we, you know, uh, take the light off of things, it, it, it opens up an opportunity for malfeasance, potentially potential malfeasance. So, uh, are, are you comfortable that 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 with these things not being public record, the, the, these uh, documents and, and and this information that 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 we'll still be able to assure ourselves that 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 no uh, improprieties are are, are going to happen as a result of this piece of legislation? Chairman Powers. Uh, yes, and what we're trying to do is just protect personal information, account numbers, uh, investment portfolios, things like that, and and um, all different types of private information, not different, not the information about the companies or anything like that, but it's just the the private personal information that uh, doesn't need to be public. Representative McKenzie, other questions? Seeing none, we're now voting on House Bill. 54, going on to calendar and rules as amended. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Chairman Powers, you're off to calendar and rules. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. <laughs> Next, we have House Bill 288 by Chairman Russell. I have a motion and a second. Chairman Russell, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
House Bill 288 increases the compensation for members of the Board of Directors of the Teleco Reservoir Development Agency to $300 per meeting and $225 per meeting of the committee uh, members. It also increases the threshold at which the sealed bids are required to purchase and uh, for purchases of contracts. They've been operating off these same numbers for 41 years, and this would just bring them up to date. Right. Are there questions for the sponsor? Representative Miller. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative, I, I support this increase, but what is this? What is, where is this agency, and would they have to come before us each and every time they want an increase in, in, in their salary? Chairman Russell. So they have to come before the Sunset Committee, but and ever so often for sunset hearings. But for these specific increases on their numbers for meetings and bid limits, they would have to come to increase them each time. That is correct. Further questions? Seeing none, we're voting on House Bill 452. All those in favor, please signify by saying, I'm sorry, House Bill 288. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? You guys have it. House Bill 288 moves on to calendar and rules. Thank your, you. Uh, your next bill, Chairman Russell, 452. Second. You have a motion and a second. You're recognized. Thank you. And I do have an amendment if uh, I have drafting code 3915. We show that amendment to be traveling with the bill. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, House Bill 452, as amended, requires a prisoner of a county workhouse or jail who is released from custody on work release or otherwise allowed to leave the grounds of the county workhouse or jail for employment or to perform work in the community, whether paid or unpaid, to use an electronic monitoring device at all times when the prisoner is not on the grounds of the jail or workhouse. It requires the employer or person utilizing the prisoners for the work to pay the cost of the electronic monitoring device and it also exempts the sheriffs for allowing the inmates to go out and do voluntary work as long as the deputy or corrections officer is with them. I see no questions, Mr. Sponsor. So seeing none, we'll be voting on House Bill 452. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 452 moves on to calendar and rules. Next on our list, House Bill 111 by Representative Capley. We have a motion and a second. Representative Capley, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. As many of you know, I'm an expert in many things and especially in solid waste, so that's why I bring it before you today. This establishes that any unpaid solid waste disposable fee would be payable to the solid waste facility in Wayne County which has a delinquency extending beyond 30 days is subject to the same penalty and interest as delinquent property taxes. Representative Shaw. Just for clarification, it's just for Wayne County, right? Representative Kaplan. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chairman Whitson. <clears throat> All right. No objections? We are voting on House Bill 111. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? No. If you'd like to be <laughs> if you'd like to be recorded as a no, please see the clerk. The ayes have it, and House Bill 111 goes on the calendar and rules. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Our next item is House Bill 62. Resident Martin, we have a motion, we have a second, we have a motion and a second. Representative Martin, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee. I do have an amendment that's traveling with the bill. Three, yeah, six, it nine. is traveling. Perfect. Good deal. Thank you, committee. This is improvement compensation for teachers in the Department of Children's Services Youth Development Centers. Main objective is to get their pay, get it up to pay for performance. State employee benefits and bonuses would be available, and then longevity pay. This is included in the governor's budget currently. Any questions? Questions for the sponsor. You guys are being awfully kind to these uh, freshmen with their first time up. 
Seeing no questions, we are voting on House Bill 62. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 62 goes on to calendar and rules. Next up, Representative Martin, you have House Bill 964. We have a motion and a second. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. This one is a um, Secretary of State bill in, guard, in regards to limited partnerships, just allowing them to use their DBA in the same way that LLCs and corporations can in Tennessee. This has a positive impact of $300. Any questions? We'll add that to the road transportation fund. <laughs> <Good>. um, <laughs> questions for the sponsor? Seeing none. We are voting on House Bill 964. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 964 moves on to calendar. Thank you, rules. Madam Chair and Committee. Representative Reedy, House Bill 893. We have a motion and a second. Representative Reedy, Chairman Reedy, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. As introduced, extends the Ground Ambulance Service Annual Assessment to June 30th of 2024. Questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we're voting on House Bill 893. Um, I do think it's appropriate here to recognize that these organizations voluntarily do this every year, and it, it really makes an impact on our budget and on the care that Tennesseans receive. So we don't take this lightly. Uh, we do appreciate. That's absolutely um, correct. Thank you. So we're voting on House Bill 893. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 893 goes on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Chairman Reedy. Chairman Boyd. Chairman Boyd is MIA, so we will... Oh, oh there, I couldn't find you. You're, you normally sit up here with the rowdy crowd, so I, I missed you there. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Boyd, do I have a motion and a second on House Bill 82? We have a motion and a second. You're recognized, and my apologies for not finding you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady and Committee. Uh, House Bill 82 and the amendment that's traveling with it uh, makes various changes to the workers' compensation statute. This was brought by the Bureau of Workers' Comp. Madam Chair, Lady, I can go into a lot of detail on it if you'd like me to. Uh, <laughs> Question has been called. Any objection to calling the question? Seeing none, we're voting on House Bill 82. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 82 goes on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Our own Chairman Keesling, and I do know where you are. Uh, you are recognized <laughs> on House Bill 356. We have a motion and a second. I hope. It was faint, but I heard it. You're recognized, Chairman Keyes. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Lady. House Bill 356 is relative to our county clerks across the state. Now, currently, anytime there's an increase in our mailing or postage fees, the only remedy for our clerks is to uh, just absorb either to absorb those costs, costs or to seek legislation year after year. So last year, we did pass a bill that allowed the clerks to raise the applicable fee that it, that they may charge for mailing out license plate renewals from four to five bucks. This applicable fee for mailing out registrations is still two dollars. But anyway, you you guys get uh, you members get the the gist of this. Where uh, this would uh, this bill would essentially marry any increase in mailing costs to the applicable fees a county clerk may already charge. Not to exceed, however any applicable U.S. postage uh, price increase in any given year. So that would just uh, trail that. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, heard. entertain any questions? Chairman Williams. No. <laughs> Seeing no questions for Chairman Kiesling, we are voting on House Bill 356. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. House Bill 356 goes on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Chair Lady and members. Chairman Whitson, you're next on our list with House Bill 675. Have a Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
This is the three-year vehicle registration for re rental vehicles. In recent years, the General Assembly passed legislation allowing rental companies a two-year plate option. This bill simply amends current law to extend the two-year plate option to three years. Following the pandemic and resulting supply chain issues, rental companies have not been able to rotate vehicles out within the 18th month time span. Instead, rental companies are now keeping their vehicles on average around 24 months. Uh, the Department of Revenue is supportive of this change. All fees must be paid at the time the vehicle is registered. As a result, fees are paid three years in advance. With that, Madam Chair, I renew my motion. You've heard the sponsor's explanation. I see no questions. We are voting on House Bill 675. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Moving on to calendar and rules. Okay, members, the last item on our agenda is item number 16. It is House Bill 152 by Chair Lady Hazelwood. We've got a motion and a second. Chair Lady Hazelwood, you are recognized on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this akin to the bill that Representative Chairman Reedy just presented. This is another assessment bill for the hospital coverage. And um, passage of this bill represents $1.8 billion for the 10 care program. The bill continues the current rate of the hospital assessment at 4.87%. It does change the base data year from um, 2000 to 2019. It was previously set at 2016. So with that, I would entertain any questions. Any questions or discussion? Questions been called. We are voting on House Bill 152 to send it to calendar and rules. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Passes. Thank you, Chairman Baum. And members, that does complete our calendar for today. We will now go out of session and in, move on to our budget hearing. So we'll ask the folks from... Um, T-Deck, I couldn't find them. <laughs> so, uh, Commissioner Salyers, if you and your team would come forward. <laughs> Commissioner, thank you for um, being here and sitting through our business session, and we are delighted to hear from you and see what's happening with TDEC and what the plans are for this year's budget with your organization. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is David Salyers. I am the Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Environment Conservation. Uh, seated with me today on my left are Deputy Commissioner Greg Young uh, of the Bureau of Environment, uh, Greer Tibwell to my immediate right, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Conservation, and our Budget Director, Scott Grammer. He'll be uh, operating the slideshow today. Uh, Thank you, but, Commissioner. Uh, Before you get started, I believe Chairman Whitson had um, something he wanted to share for the good of the body. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I want to congratulate y'all, uh, the state parks, for being uh, designated as the agency of the year by the Park Law Enforcement uh, Association. For And that was to reflect not only the leadership, but also the great work our park rangers do at our state parks. And congratulations to you and your team. Thank you. We have the best rangers in the country, sir. The best park system. We have uh, great absolutely. State parks. Absolutely. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. We'll right. make it even better. We uh, look forward to that. With your uh, with your support. But thanks so much for the opportunity for us to discuss our FY23-24 budget request. Look forward to working with you and the rest of the members throughout the process. And uh, I won't go over each item in the proposed budget, uh, but they are all critical to making Tennessee keeping us at the best place to live, work, play, and to raise a family. And I do want to highlight a couple of specific items uh, before turning it over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Young and Deputy Commissioner uh, Tibwell. But uh, first, the governor's budget, uh, proposed budget, reflects the belief that Tennessee's conservation strategy can balance Tennessee's economic growth with protection of our environment. And he's entrusted our environment, our department, to help execute that vision and from the conversations I've had with our team, 
uh, they are poised and definitely ready to deliver on that vision. Conservation of our natural resources is a significant driver of economic prosperity in Tennessee, especially in our rural communities. It also protects our environment, improves the health, and enhances the quality of life that we all enjoy here in Tennessee. And I know that you share with me in the excitement about the future of the state of Tennessee, and these meaningful outdoor experiences that we enjoy do help to create bonds between people and the places they call home, and our natural assets are among the best in the nation. Governor Lee and I want to ensure these assets are protected for generations to come, and this budget proposes to do just that. So I'd like to thank you all again, and now I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Tibwell for budget highlights from the Bureau of Conservation. Thank you, Commissioner Salyers. Um, there we go. Thank you, Commissioner Salyers, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, Representative Woodson, thank you for the call out on our Rangers. Uh, one of the things that I've had the deep privilege to do over the last six months since pulling into uh, this spot is uh, come to recognize the degree to which our rangers support their communities on a very holistic basis and the degree to which they now, um, maybe more than they have in the past, understand the economic impact that they bring uh, to, their, to the communities across Tennessee. So I really appreciate that um, shout out for that team. Um, as an economic driver, outside recreation and conservation are critical to Tennessee. And Governor Lee is asked to push forward to establish four new state parks uh, in this budget proposal. And those state parks are scattered across the state. And I'll just uh, highlight them briefly, beginning just north of Jackson with Middle Fork Bottoms, which is a uh, water conservation and flood control system uh, that is being also highlighted as a recreation area. And to advance that to state park position is gonna bring uh, a great deal of development of recreation and outside um, fun there at the uh, Middle Fork Bottoms. Moving to the east, Devil's Backbone straddles the National uh, Natchez Trace Parkway and is gonna provide us a platform for highlighting state parks across the state for those folks who come down the Natchez Trait Parkway and uh, get a chance to see that particular state park when it gets developed. Moving on to the east, um, the Scotts Gulf Wilderness State Park will be uh, joining multiple state natural areas up on the Cumberland Plateau. It's an area that's currently operated out of Fall Creek Falls. And as it gets established into a uh, standalone state park, um, is gonna provide great vistas, great hiking, and uh, great economic development for that community. And then um, at, the, uh, at the southern terminus of the Justin P. Wilson Cumberland Trail State Park, North Chickamauga Creek Gorge, um, when established as a state park, is gonna provide more safety for the people and, and, and the um, users of that great natural resource there that is North Chickamauga Creek Gorge. It's already just about being loved to death and getting that extra um, overlay of state park and state park uh, amenities and focus is gonna be a big uh, support for the users of that park if, when it gets established. Uh, the governor's budget also includes enhancement of three of our state natural areas. Uh, providing those natural areas with ranger service so that um, as the use of those areas increases, that can be done in a way that will make them safe for my mother-in-law to feel comfortable going out there and enjoying a hike at those state natural areas. That's a big step forward. And um, those enhancements are gonna take currently state-owned land and manage them in a very effective and efficient way to help balance the ongoing economic growth and allow for outdoor recreation and conservation. So um, with that, I'll turn that over to my partner, Greg Young. And uh, go ahead, Greg. Yes, sir. Thank you, Greer. Uh, Madam Chair, lady and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk with you a little bit today. Uh, we have some exciting uh, opportunities to discuss on the uh, Bureau of Environment side as well. Um, the first uh, opportunity uh, we call uh, TN Clean and uh, helps us safeguard our future. And the, the real objectives of this program are to invest dollars into environmental cleanup activities across the state 
so that we can then facilitate ongoing economic development opportunities. Our mindset is that it's better to clean up and reuse existing properties rather than overdevelop our, our beautiful agricultural lands and other green spaces. So that's why we uh, think it's a good idea to invest in these cleanup activities. Uh, for so long, we've seen a lot of the, the, the development focused on the urban areas, and that will continue. Make no mistake, there will inevitably be cleanup activities that continue on, on in urban areas. But we also want to extend our reach into some of those rural areas that need attention as well. Um, the way we would propose doing that, the proposed investments we would make to achieve these objectives are, are really four big ones. The first one deals with uh, what are called state obligated sites, or there's an accounting standard, GASB 49, that's used to describe those, uh, a list of sites. And um, we, uh, we, we appreciate the General Assembly uh, last year approving $25 million to help us get started on cleaning up those sites. We are now requesting another $40 million this year so we can finish the job. Uh, we believe this investment will enable us to investigate and clean up all 44 of these GASB 49 state-obligated Superfund sites. Uh, we're also looking at dry cleaner sites. In the past, dry cleaners used chemicals that sometimes leaked into the soil, and, and you'll have them in strip malls and whatnot that just need attention, need to be redeveloped, that kind of thing, and, and need to be cleaned up. So uh, we are proposing $5 million to really jumpstart some investigation activities and hopefully start some remediation of those, uh, of those dry cleaner sites. We believe we will be able to do that at all 47 of the sites with the $5 million. Now, that is not totally cleaning up those sites. We just have to understand what's there first. So that's what we're going to use that, 40, uh, that $5 million for. Uh, Oak Ridge Reservation is another thing that is really important uh, to our state's uh, potential economic development. In that area, you hear things like new nuclear. You hear things about nuclear renaissance. And so what you're seeing is a World War II nuclear uh, enterprise that's now turning into uh, a really great economic development opportunity. But we need to clean some of that up first, okay? And so rather than uh, just relying on the federal government to do all the work, we are putting our own skin in the game, if you will, and allowing the state to help facilitate that work to drive that economic development and that nuclear renaissance in that area. Um, last but not least uh, is what we call the, uh, oh, by the way, on the nuclear stuff, on the Oak Ridge stuff, we're already in discussions with ECD, um, Governor Lee, Propose 25 million for TDEC on the cleanup side, but also 50 million to ECD on the economic development side. So, so this committee knows we are already having those discussions and wanting to keep coordinating on that. Uh, last but not least, brownfield sites, and uh, we'll talk about this one on the next slide. But uh, suffice it to say, this is an area where we would uh, propose 5.3 million for grants to local governments for education outreach investigation and cleanup of contaminated sites. Currently, we know of at least 175 of these sites across the state that could really benefit from this effort. So let's go to the Brownfield uh, next slide, the Rural Brownfields Investment Act. And, and I'll be quick here, y'all. Um, this one, y'all are probably already familiar with it because um, I think you've already uh, moved this along in your committee. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you for uh, your support of that. Thank you for your positive feedback on that. We appreciate it. Um, we hope to stimulate and incentivize beneficial reuse of previously developed property through this program. Um, again, to preserve those agricultural lands and other green spaces. Uh, we we really want to work with local governments and have because they are the people on the ground that can help us identify, investigate, and clean up these properties. We also think it's important to create, that, create those opportunities for private investment in those cleanups, okay? The way that our law is structured that if a private party wants to come in and take agreed actions to address environmental contamination, the state will step up and give uh, what's called a brownfield agreement to that party to relieve them of environmental liability for those agreed actions. So we think this is a really good uh, 
opportunity for the state to stimulate uh, cleanup and economic growth. Next one, please. This is just an example of some of those brownfield sites that where we have seen, you know, sites that are dormant or um, need, need some fixing up. Uh, where we've seen that happen in the past, we think we can take it to the next level with this legislation and the um, appropriation. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide we call investing in strategic growth because we really think it's important to ensure that there's clean and abundant water so our state can continue to grow and prosper. And at the same time, we have to preserve and conserve what is uniquely Tennessee when it comes to our waters. Uh, we are obviously blessed with beautiful waterways, waterfalls, things like that. And, and so much so that we do see some other states trying to poach our water. You know, you had Mississippi trying to sue us. You, you had Georgia trying to change the state line at one time. Well, we think the best way to uh, actually protect our waters is to fully understand what we have and plan for the use and future needs and uses of those resources. So what we are proposing as far as investments to accomplish those objectives would be $1.1 million to establish a framework for planning and distribution of water resources that will empower communities, local communities, to make strategic decisions about growth and development, how they want to grow and develop around those waters. At the same time, we have a unique opportunity with a lot of the infrastructure funding to foster regional collaboration right now. Instead of having a bunch of little straws in a little river, what about having a big straw that feeds a lot of, a lot of communities in a bigger waterway? Um, that's a good thing from an environmental standpoint. Um, we also are proposing $4.7 million to address nutrient pollution by working with municipalities nutrient pollution. Um, what we're talking about there is excess phosphorus, nitrogen, things like that that cause algae. The bottom line to me is nobody likes to swim or fish or paddle around in a bunch of algae, okay? And so in order for us to do the good work to clean that up, what we want to do is partner with the Department of Ag on this one. Ag, Ag gets a bunch of uh, what's called 319B money from uh, the U.S. EPA to address runoff from agricultural fields like and fertilizer and things. What we want to do is focus on those urban areas and address the urban runoff. And so that's why we are proposing a $4.7 million grant program to identify with these local communities various projects that they could take on uh, to reduce that nutrient runoff to get rid of the algae. Um, as you can tell, I, I, I get kind of fired. I, I get fired up about this stuff. It's some exciting opportunities. We've got some really just fantastic opportunities to build on the success of the water and wastewater infrastructure work that we've done so far, and we appreciate your support. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Commissioner Salyers. Uh, thanks, uh, Drew and Greg, uh, for your comments. And uh, Madam Chair, I want to close by expressing my optimism for our state uh, and our department. And um, like, like the governor, uh, we do believe that Tennessee's conservation strategy can balance economic growth with a plan to protect our environment. And our state is certainly blessed with natural beauty and rich resources. And I look forward to working with all of you to help protect those resources for uh, the benefit of generations to come. Thank you, Commissioner. We are blessed in the state um, with all, you know, just about every topography you could name a lot of it in my district. I have mountains and rivers and if we just had an ocean, we'd have it all, but then we'd have to worry about the water rising. So maybe we're in a better place. We do have a, a number of questions and I just had just a quick one before other people get started on the Oak Ridge reclamation project. I'm, you know, it's great that we're being proactive as a state and putting our money in and getting the work done. But is there any opportunity for reimbursement from the federal government for dollars that we invest in this since it was the federal government who did the polluting? Yes, ma'am. Under the applicable law that governs that cleanup, there is an opportunity for what's called cost recovery. Uh, we don't think that should necessarily be the, the lead message because hopefully we can collaborate with the federal government and perhaps leverage these dollars short of 
having to do cost recovery to um, leverage the federal government to step up. Um, but we also recognize that sometimes we may need to cost recover. When you're on the finance committee, you really do <laughs> yes, like to do things that get your money back. Yes, so, ma'am. Um, Understood. Thank you for helping us to make sure we pursue that. First on my list is Chairman Faison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, team, very good to see y'all. Uh, due to high collections in the realty transfer tax, TDEC has uh, several reserve accounts which have grown significantly recently. State Lands Acquisition Fund and the Local Parts Acquisition Fund. These funds collectively increased more than $22 million in one year for a combined balance of over $90 million. So I have a few questions about that. First of all, the Local Parks Acquisition Fund is, is to be used for grants to local government. The fund has grown continuously over the last four years. How many grants are issued from this fund annually? Are funds being awarded evenly throughout the state? Are any coming to my county? If few grants are being awarded, <laughs> that really wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> if a few grants are being awarded, is there just not a need or the local government's just not aware of the availability? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for that question. And, and Greer is going to take that one on for us with the with the assistance of uh, our budget director, Scott. How sure. Th thank you, Chairman Faison. A couple of things to um, address first from an operational perspective on the, on the on those grants. Um, the current director of the division that runs that has shifted that program from a <laughs> once every other year granting invitation to a twice a year granting invitation. So to the extent that the concern is that we're building up instead of spending out those funds, that's recognized and we're trying to take some steps to make sure that money is getting on the street, bringing recreational opportunities and land conservation opportunities to the local governments. So uh, from a directional perspective, um, what I'm reading into your, your question is something that I absolutely share uh, in my role and we're moving in that direction. So, but I, w I do want to ask Scott to um, dive in a little bit more to the details of the current fund balance and the current request for grant applications that are out there. Thanks. If that's all right. Chair Lady, can I double? So specifically for me. Yes, sir. What I hear from home and from members on here, there are often, our locals have no clue what's available. So as you speak of this, Deputy Commissioner, speak to the, uh, speak to how my county Chairman Hawks County, uh, Jason Zachary, Representative Zachary, how did they? How are they made aware of these potential grants that are available? As you speak to it, so um, that particular program in the department involves bringing the recreation professionals across the state together and giving them the information about the grants to then take that into the communities. So one of the things that I'm trying to get a better handle on and, and, a, and a visibility to is what are those exact communication routes to make sure that particular issue is covered. Um, I think that another aspect of those grant programs that is deserving of continued focus is making sure that to the extent those grants require matching resources, we're level setting our expectation for the capacity to do those grant matching in terms of what our, especially our rural counties can actually afford to do. So um, I, I hear the concern there about making sure that the counties and the local officials get a chance to know about these opportunities and then have the kind of technical assistance that helps them make good applications and get that money flowing out. So if I might turn to Scott, about the current status of those uh, uh, of those uh, balances. Thanks, Scott. Sure. Um, so, of the fund balance that is on the green sheet, uh, the current amount of outstanding that we have is about twenty million dollars that's still to come back in that we will then reimburse back out, and then we just closed our grant cycle for this last, and we we anticipate about twenty five million dollars to be. Um, requested from that grant cycle so of the balance that you see on the green sheet probably it will, most of it will be um would say about eight million dollars would be left over at the end of all of um of 
of those two. So, so if, if I might, if I might, Chairman Faison. So what Scott's sharing with us is <clears throat> the number in the green sheet is from last summer's balance. So about 20 million of that has already been granted out. And we expect 25 more million to be granted out from the invitation for grant applications that was just issued in February. So that should bring that 53 million down to about 8 million and get that money out on the street where I think we all want it to be. Thank you. A few more questions. The state lands acquisition fund is separated from the state parks operations and maintenance funds, which have a collective balance of almost 66 million. Fiscal year 23, 24 budget also includes 1.5 million recurring funds for state park maintenance. Why is this appropriation needed? Can these reservations, can these reserves not be utilized for this purpose or any of the projects outlined in the capital budget? Scott, would you like to take that one? Sure. So um, I guess I'll start with the major maintenance fund first. Um, so that is for our minor maintenance and that's just our typical run of the mill type of budget there. Um, so every, every year we're able to carry forward a little bit of that. It's usually between five to $800,000 that we're rolling forward. Now it's all on the obligations side, it's all spent, but we just have not yet had um, the vouchers come back in from the vendors to actually push that back out the door to them. Um, the state lands acquisition fund, um, again, most of that is in fact um, obligated. So uh, we have you know, a pretty good amount of balance there, but I would say that most of that is held back in as, as an obligation for something that is ongoing. It's either a potential target or it's something that we're holding back uh, to do a completion of something. Can Chairman I, Faison. Can I have one more question? So one more question. Last year, this committee appropriated uh, in the neighborhood of $560,000 for a pool, Panther Creek State Park. Um, all kind of he said, she said with that didn't happen. Not going to point fingers. My question to y'all is there was a direction for that didn't happen. What, what are y'all planning to do at Panther Creek moving forward? And what happened to that $560,000 that this committee passed with the direction to do something. I want to ask Scott to address the 560,000 and then I'll be glad to share about what we're planning to do next. So the money that was that was um, appropriated for that project, um, it was it will sit in the capital budget. It is not spent by us. So that that's the current uh, disposition of that money. And moving forward yeah. and, with and that park and will that 560 that we put, will it be part of whatever renovations or whatever takes place moving forward? Yeah, the, the current plan for the renovation up there is to establish a um, an event center at Panther Creek. Um, I think there's a budget um, amount in about a $12.5 million project there to establish an event center at Panther Creek. Um, so that's the, the major go forward game plan uh, to support year round use of the park, year round um, opportunities for families and others to come onto the park and, and hold events there. Yes. Um, to follow up on that, um, I had heard quite a bit of feedback on this issue and there was some concern that perhaps the local governments, the local um, folks there we're not as excited about the event center as some folks in TDAC might have been. So I just want to know how we're going about, and is that the monies that you're talking about, the $12 million for Panther Creek, is that in this budget? And I have, so you're including the whole $12 million and the 560 is still sitting in the, the capital fund has not been allocated. Is that, that where we stand at the current that's, moment? That's my understanding, yes, Madam Chair. But that list includes uh, Panther Creek. So uh, again, I would just encourage all of us to make sure that what we're doing with these dollars, we've got a lot of money that's going out to a lot of places but I would encourage us to make sure that what we're doing is at least something that the local governments are going to support and um, hopefully be a participant in uh, and not just the state. So 
that's an editorial comment and will be far scum. That's all we'll say about that. Uh, Chairman Whitson, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Chair Lady, and again, Commissioner and team, welcome. And uh, um, first of all, I want to recognize your legislative liaison, Blair Beatty. She does a great job representing you here up at the General Assembly of the Cordell Hall Building, and we appreciate it. So, um, <laughs> Commissioner, my, I don't have a state park in my county, first of all, just for the record. I wish it, we did. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping when the governor announced four during his state of the state, I was, but it wasn't close. But anyway, ma'am, uh, committee, uh, this has to do with the Heritage Conservation Trust Fund. The governor's propose, proposal to preserve outdoor heritage for state parks, natural areas, and forests would establish 33 new positions and make a $300 million non-recurring deposit into the Heritage Conservation Trust Fund. Question is, TDAC, TWRA, and Agriculture are closely or collectively responsible for establishing a spending plan for the State Land Acquisition Fund and the Local Parks Acquisition Fund. Is that how this fund is operated? If not, how is spending from the fund governed? And also, well, I'll let you answer that first before I go on for the others. Okay. Well, I'll give just a, a brief overview on that. We do work very closely with the uh, Department of Agriculture and, and TWRA. I, I meet with the executive director of TWRA and the commissioner of ag uh, uh, monthly. And uh, one of the things that, that we're all really focused on, I mean, while each of uh, the, we're, we're the three major departments or agencies that, that hold land. Uh, we try to look at it from the perspective that uh, it's not TWRA land. It's not TDEC land. It's not division of forestry through uh, Department of Agricultural Properties, it's state properties. And what is the best and highest use for that? And we have partnered at uh, Cedars of Lebanon. We're working at Scott's Gulf in Fall Creek Falls. Mm -hmm. And we're, uh, we're working at Natchez Trace State Park very closely where we have the proximity of those properties adjacent to us uh, to make sure that we, we are all aligned in getting the best utility out of the property. Uh, with respect to the $300 million, do you want to talk about those numbers, yeah. uh, Greer? Be glad to, and just thirty million um, for the Heritage Conservation oh. Trust Fund. W would you like for me to repeat? Would help if I repeat the question, or you got yep. it there? I, I, I'd be glad to hear it again. Okay, sir. So, uh, TDAC, TWRA, and the Agriculture are collectively responsible for establishing a spending plan for the State Land Acquisition Fund and the Local Parks Acquisition Fund. Is that how this fund is operated? If not, how is spending from the fund governed? And are there restrictions on how that funding can be used? Yeah. So one of one of the um, aspects about land conservation that I'm, I'm learning about, quite frankly, Representative, is the multitude of of, of um, tools that have been established to make sure that we can address conservation land acquisitions with a strategic approach. And the Heritage Conservation Trust Fund is a little different from the State Lands Acquisition Fund. Okay. And um, the work together with those three departments who have state lands does establish and has established a planning approach for spending that together and keep in alignment on how that how that money is spent. So, Scott, you look like you've got a, an addition to that you want to make? Okay. So there is a plan and there is a, uh, a governing operation on how to do that, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, historically, uh, what has been the balance of the Heritage Conservation Trust Fund? So, um, until this request for the $30 million to, to, to reboot that, organ, uh, that fund, um, that fund has been running a, a single-digit millions balance and kind of been holding in a um, kind of a holding pattern, sir. And then um, in the past, when there was funding of that board, they proved themselves very focused on leveraging private funding, leveraging partners such as the, um, uh, the Nature Conservancy and others who bring private money into the land conservation and leveraging those funds to get even more for the state dollars that are available. And um, in fact, that, that uh, board just met yesterday. I met with them and what I heard from that team on that board, the board members, was a commitment 
if they are refunded, as we're, as we're requesting, to bring that type of leverage strategy back into what they do going forward. One more. Chairman Whitson. Okay, thank you. And one more question. Um, according to our, the response to the, uh, our House Finance Ways and Means questionnaire that we sent out in January, TDEC has 418 vacancies. And, uh, and the question, I guess, is why create 33 new positions rather than reclassify and utilize the vacant positions? Um, so the majority of those, I'd say over 200 and, and I guess around 250 or so, they they sit in our park system. Um, a lot of those are, um, a lot of those folks are our are, are seasonal workers. Okay. So we ramp up in the spring, kind of ramp back down as the season kind of goes into the winter time. So that's the reason why you see a lot of the vacancies is because of that kind of hiring and rehiring um, as we kind of go through our busy season for parks. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. What about the other 200 <laughs> plus? Those sit in, a, I guess, a very wide variety of um, seats, shall we say, um, that are spread out um, amongst our various, um, um, I'm sorry, among our various groups. So. Um, but again, it still comes, does beg the question, if you have over 200 vacancies and you're trying to fill 33, if you, we couldn't reallocate funding, but um, again, we'll move on. Chairman Zachary. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioner and team. Good to see you guys. Uh, just some questions related to the IT infrastructure modernization, the money we've appropriated over the last couple of years. I believe $15 million a few years ago, about 800000 last year, and then this year we're appropriating an additional 563000 Can you just give us an overview of the current status of the, the IT infrastructure in general, um, what's the, the additional 563,000 for this year, what that's being utilized for and just kind of priority of projects. Please. Okay. And, and I'll talk about just, uh, the 563 first, since it is in the budget that is really, uh, there for subscriptions, license, licensing of the software that we actually utilize. And that will go forward with respect to the, the, um, 15 million that was, I think, uh, approved in fiscal year. 21 mm. and uh and, and principally what you know so, some of the things that were really focused on there is as you can imagine tdex a fairly uh complex organization with a bunch of different divisions in particular regulatory programs i think we found in uh, my first year we got 286 uh disparate databases that don't communicate well with one another and we can't utilize those we discovered that we weren't collecting the revenues that we needed to be collecting. And, uh, and then through some audit findings, we were encouraged to uh, improve some of those systems. So we've been working through that one step at a time. Early on, it's really focused on the, the invoicing and the receipt of the invoices, and then also migrating everything to the cloud. So we do have that backup. So we are going through that process of uh, uh, spending down that $15 million and uh, because those are non-recurring funds, the 563 and some of the, the I think the 800 you saw last year, I think it was associated with our move to uh, uh, to Davy Crockett Tower, which is projected in 2024. One of the things that this has enabled us to do with the IT modernization program is to really look at our, our footprint across the state. And uh, right now we occupy somewhere between, somewhere around 22, 23% of the Tennessee Tower and we will re be reducing our footprint by 30% when we move to Davy Crockett Tower. And then this technology and the capabilities that we're developing is gonna allow us to work in the field more often and more efficient, efficiently and have more of a hybrid model. One more, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. Chairman Zachary. So, so in terms of the roadmap over the next 12 months, because I think like <laughs> when, when, when after the pandemic, labor was here mm -hmm. and obviously they were woefully unprepared for and the commissioner knew that at the time and so the pandemic just exposed the desperate need and they had been just kind of patchworking and other departments have had said the sim said similar things and so i applaud you for being for for thinking and really being proactive in uh, addressing this so what does the roadmap look like for the next 12 months in terms of just the department in general uh, yeah we're we're going to uh we will be continuing we contracted with ey to help us go through this process so so right now we're taking uh, one, one division at a time and we're mapping processes. We call them lean events and green events. 
this IT modernization is just not about bringing in new servers and and the hardware and things like that. It's about mapping those processes. We become so dependent on uh, institutional knowledge instead of mapping the processes out. So we are mapping through those processes one project at a time. And uh, with the goal uh, is to make our employees work more efficient, you know, with a goal of efficient and effective government. And then uh, on the outward facing side, a more uh, customer friendly experience and high quality customer service. So, so we'll keep working toward that. With respect to IT modernization, I think that the way that uh, technology changes, it never ends. And uh, but uh, at the at the at the end of uh, in about three years, we're projecting about five years to work through the fifteen million dollars. So we're taking it very methodically and making sure that we we get it right. Uh, I heard the saying once: Are you trying to put an interstate on a pig trail? And we're trying to make sure that we're laying that groundwork, the foundational groundwork, enterprise-wide with TDEC. We have a tremendous relationship with uh, strategic technology solutions, and we're working hand-in-hand -hand with them to make sure that enterprise-wide across the state that, that what we're putting in place is going to be functional for years to come. Well, Commissioner, that was a very thorough answer. And I say that with all sincerity. Uh, that should provide confidence to this committee, the dollars that we appropriate and invest um, I, at a many that we have heard testify related to IT infrastructure, modernization, and steps being taken. That was as solid as an answer I, as I've heard. So that's is, encouraging. Is this being recorded? Can I carry Can we, it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Freeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you for being here today. The proposed budget includes $81.7 million. Uh, 71 and a half of that is non-recurring. Um, the department has stated that 25 million of the 70 million appropriations of the hazardous waste remedial action fund will be used to clean up Oak Ridge. Um, what's the timeline uh, for the cleanup uh, at Oak Ridge? Uh, and then you've also stated the federal government will reimburse uh, uh, the state fund, the state uh, for these, the, the costs there. How certain is the department that these are reimbursable expenses uh, and, um, when do you think we should expect those reimbursements to be received? Well, I, I'll uh, I'll start out with this. We we currently do have an agreement with the Department of Energy and EPA. It is a federal facilities mm -hmm. agreement, and uh, and, and we work through that. and And right now, Oak Ridge uh, funds us on the front end through uh, the Department of Energy grants, and uh, but there are certain instances when they don't, and there are certain things that we want to do to make sure that something is being accelerated or we wanna make sure that the cleanup is right. And then we can expend those dollars to do that. And uh, I'll refer to my general counsel, but sometimes it takes a minute to get those reimbursements back. But it's fairly clear in the federal facility agreement that we have, that we do have that right to, to be reimbursed for those dollars. And we have, you know, we're, it's a, we have a really good relationship with the Department of Energy right now. And uh, uh, that's not always the case. And we have a really good working relationship with EPA and DO, DO, DOE on that. So uh, Greg can go into more detail for sure. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question, Representative. I, I appreciate it. Um, um, as I understood, there were really two parts to the question. One was kind of the timing on spending down the $25 million, and the second is kind of ensuring that the process of potential cost recovery is there. On the timing, we would see this as not, we're not going to spend all $25 million in one year. Um, we wouldn't. I don't know that we'll spend it in five, but it will carry forward and enable us to overcome some of those bureaucratic log jams when you have certain people that will disagree about, well, do we need to put sampling wells here, here, here? If the state feels strongly that it needs a sampling well to understand what the groundwater looks like, we can pay for it ourselves and then cost recover it. So the timing, I would say, that that is a long burn on the cleanup generally when it comes to Oak Ridge. That's not something that you know I want to have the committee expect that we can deliver a clean Oak Ridge in uh, three to five years. We would anticipate needing to you draw down on those funds going into the future. Now, as far as the process and how we can give you assurance that this money would be cost recoverable under the federal law. Over the past two years, we instituted a series of just 
SO, uh, standard operating procedures, protocols, things like that, to make sure that the, the threshold requirement is that the expenditures have to be consistent with the national contingency plan. That's under the federal regulations, the NCP. And so what we have done with all of our operations in Oak Ridge is have very meticulous detailed records uh, and to be able to, if we do have to cost recover for anything we do, regardless of the 25 million, that we can actually prove it up and have those records to say this cost was consistent with the national contingency plan. Representative Freeman. Thank you. That was a very clear answer. Uh, can you, um, Commissioner, can you pr uh, provide an overview of how other environmental cleanup efforts will be handled? Um, will the department provide grants to agencies, contract cleaning efforts out, handle, handle the cleanup efforts within departmental resources? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> Commissioner was asking whether I needed to call our Director of Division of Remediation. I probably should, but I will do my best to answer that question. Um, we would not see um, trying to add a lot of staff and, and grow um, our ranks within the Division of Remediation to carry out some of these cleanup efforts. We do intend to rely on local governments, um, IDBs, various organizations that can identify where those needs are locally. To uh, Madam Chair Lady's um, uh, request to include local governments in our decision making, we absolutely are doing that here. So the opportunity to weave those uh, folks into uh, identifying and actually collaborating with them to carry out those cleanups is uh, first and foremost uh, a priority. Uh, we are in the process now, based on the prior $25 million for our TN Clean project, uh, we have started putting together kind of the manual of, of how we need to work with local governments. We've had at least one or two meetings of uh, a coordinating group that's helping oversee and advise us and target certain sites uh, based on that local government input. With And we will have to use some sort of outside uh, environmental consulting contracting to actually carry out some of that cleanup activity. Um, for the brownfield side, um, we have actually already started putting together in the hopes that that uh, legislation and funding passes, we are starting to put, a get, put together a grant manual for the local governments and other entities to work with us um, in the anticipation that we want to spend let's assume we get through July and, and we uh, have legislation and funding, we need to spend a few months really doing some education with those local governments, with the other entities to make sure that once the grant cycle rolls, rolls around, we have people applying for it that want to access those funds. So um, that's our game plan to work with all of the above representative and especially focusing on making sure local governments are woven into uh, our calculus there. Leader Cochran. Thank you, Chair Lady. And thank you, Commissioner, for, for being here. Just wanted uh, to follow up a little bit. We talked some earlier about the, um, uh, the $25 million cleanup for the Oak Ridge site, and then also uh, in 2022, TVA announced it's moving forward with plans of expanding nuclear operations, ECD, um, has $50 million in non-recurring for nuclear energy investment funds. So, so kind of a focus on nuclear energy. So can, can you tell us about TDEC's role regarding the oversight and potential regulation uh, of nuclear energy in Tennessee? I mean, do, do you have a vision for maybe, uh, as, we, as we have a broader focus on that, does TDEC have a role in there? I, I think from the standpoint of supporting economic community development for that uh, that $50 million, most certainly. I think a lot of people probably don't understand the role that uh, TDEC plays in recruitment of industry and expansion of industry and things along those lines. Uh, with respect to the nuclear, nuclear reactors and things like that, that's governed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, we... Our role is uh, is lesser in in that regard. It's certainly a very important part of our response in emergencies of a nuclear release, as we coordinate with TEMA, Tennessee Emergency Management Agency, on that. We also have a division of radiological health, which goes around that they do inspect uh, 
veterinary clinics, dentist office, uh, doctor's clinics, hospitals, and we work closely with them. Greg, do you want to embellish uh, or elaborate? <laughs> uh, uh, let me well withdraw played. that from the record. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see if we can delete that. From yeah, the video. thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I'm just an engineer. I'm good with numbers. He's better with words. Yeah. Um, I think the commissioner did a great job going through our, our primary roles when it comes to um, uh, nuclear oversight. The 25 million obviously is going to focus on the cleanup of the former nuclear areas. Um, the only other thing I'd add is we do have an office of energy policy. Uh, Molly Cripps, mm -hmm. if yeah. she'll wait at the crowd and uh, Molly has been very engaged in uh, a lot of nuclear opportunities as well from more of a, I'd say it's the carrot side, non-regulatory carrot side. And, and if I may, uh, uh, Representative Cochran, just really follow up on, you know, when you look at Oak Ridge, you look at, you know, now we have one area that's cleaned up with the exception of some groundwater contamination. It's called East Tennessee Technology Park. There's a lot of really advanced uh, industry that is looking to move there and is moving there. We're in the process now moving to Y-12 to clean up some of the mercury and and uh, radionucleides and uh, all the other bad stuff there. And then we have Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which we work very closely with and on the cleanup side. But but getting those properties back in place so so that these companies that come in here that are on the cutting edge with nuclear technologies, whether it's medical or energy production or, or whatever it is, but being close to that laboratory and being able to access the facilities at Oak Ridge National Laboratory is, is a real big driver. So cleaning those properties up as quickly as we can is what we want to do. Great. Thank you. A, a, a very effective elaboration, I'm sure, with no embellishment there. We, we, we appreciate that. Thank you. That's going to take me a minute to live that one now, I can say. Uh, <laughs> Um, Chairman Boyd, I keep looking to the wrong place for you. You've just uh, really sure. confused me today by moving your seat. Chair Lady, I'm going to try to get back up there next week if I can, <laughs> if I can make it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair Lady and Commissioner and team. It's great to see you today. Just had a quick question about the uh, electric grid formula grant. It looks like it's in year two of uh, and some non recurring dollars, $8.8 .8 million. Uh, most of that being federal. Can you just tell us a little bit about what that? what that grant hopes to achieve and who the dollars are flowing to. What was the name of that polar vortex that came through here a few months back? Um, and we had all the, the, the rolling blackouts and the temporary shutdowns and things along those lines. That's a big part of it. I think our role is really more in support of TVA on that. I'm hopefully I'm getting, getting a good, getting a good nod on that. And uh, because I think that's one of their, yes, we can, we're going to invite uh, Molly Cripps up, but, uh, one of the things, one of the biggest challenges for TVA is modernization of that electric grid and how that works. So it is resilient and we can provide the power. Uh, there's going to be a shift, you know, in, uh, in how power needs to be provided, uh, you know, from uh, as, as, the, uh, as the markets move to electric vehicles and as we continue to grow as a state. Yeah. All right. All right, y'all. I'm, I'm Molly Cripps. I'm the director of the Office of Energy Programs, and um, we oversee a variety of federal programs that are funded through the Department of Energy. This particular program that's an Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act program, what is in your budget is year two, but I will note that we have not yet received the federal funds for year one. The application for year one and year two is due at the end of this month. As far as who is eligible, TVA as a grid operator could be eligible. Um, local power companies um, as uh, distribution grid operators could be eligible. In reviewing the eligible projects, which is a, a laundry list, um, we have determined that what we will likely do is focus on distribution grid because the particular projects must focus on where we have seen a greater number of outages. And as we know, many of our local power companies are smaller municipals or um, very rural electric cooperatives uh, that may be uh, not as well positioned as TVA would be to take care of their grid um, 
modernization needs. So we'll likely focus on local power companies with this. Um, and as far as the eligible projects, again, as I mentioned, it's a laundry list. It is everything from vegetation management um, to replacing the wire so that you have less line loss from the point of, say, the substation where um, the uh, transmission comes in and the distribution goes out. So it's uh, quite diverse and um, we will work with uh, local power companies. Um, we've already been in touch, as I mentioned, with TBA, Tennessee Electric uh, Cooperative Association, um, Tennessee Municipal Electric Power Association, and Tennessee Valley Public Power Association to make sure that information will get pushed out to all the local power companies. So if you have other questions, I'm happy to um, provide information after the hearing. Thank you. Chairman Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so we appreciate that. And I know that the TBA testified in front of our committee and or the business utilities and it seemed like some of their critical instrumentation was the 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 big problem that it just wasn't uh, weatherized, I guess is the way to put it. But yeah, I, I hope that those dollars do flow to our, our electrical co-ops or our municipal uh, electrical providers because they certainly don't have the funds that TVA does. And I think TVA is on that. The next question that I had is if you could just tell us uh, a, a little bit about the state energy program grant. I sure can. Um, the state energy program grant, we do receive formula funds annually for that, but what is recognized in the budget um, is um, an infusion um, under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. These are the most flexible funds that the U.S. Department of Energy provides directly to states and flows to state energy offices. And um, to give you just a broad overview of this, we use those funds for everything from education and outreach. We have a K-12 program that we run um, that is focused on educating educators so that they can teach um, STEM classes um, from, you know, again, as I said, from, from K through, through 12, uh, that is an opportunity that we make available for no charge to educators. And we um, provide accommodations and food while they are at their camps and um, providing them with also resources once they leave the camp that they can utilize in their classrooms as well. So that's, a, a, again, an example of what we can do for education. Outreach, we support a number of, um, of different groups, whether it be Tennessee Solar Energy Industries Association and educating the public about solar and storage, um, also working with um, cohorts known as uh, Drive Electric Tennessee is one that is a combination of a bunch of um, different utilities, uh, local governments, uh, universities, economic and community development agencies, et cetera, uh, and then also providing funding and financing opportunities. We have supported a revolving loan fund that is operated by CDFI, um, Pathway Lending. Uh, it is an energy efficiency loan program that funds both energy efficiency and renewable energy um, projects for not-for-profit and for-profit entities as well as local governments. Uh, we've also... Uh, leverage the state energy program funds so that we can operate other federally funded programs. An example of that is EPA's Diesel Emissions Reduction Act program uh, that provides funds for um, the, um, if you will, changing out of um, vehicles and um, moving from uh, diesel to other uh, cleaner types of fuel. So that's how we've utilized those funds over the years for this particular funding um, source. We have proposed to DOE a number of different projects and um, that has not been approved yet by DOE, but uh, the bulk of those would be in state parks. We would be looking at a microgrid project at Pickwick Landing and uh, the purpose of that is Pickwick is a staging area for TEMA. And if we have a new Madrid event, we would uh, love to make sure that we have power there. So um, hopefully we will hear from DOE this month about those projects moving forward, but would be glad to provide you with that list of what we have proposed. Thank you. And next on our list is Representative Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I've got a, a comment and then a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, as a real estate attorney and a developer, I've had extensive interactions with your department over the last two decades. And I, I want to start with the good news. The 
the change in interaction and the experience of interacting with your department is noticeable. And I want to thank you for that. Um, the last several years have been a much more enjoyable experience working with your department. So thank you for that. Now I've got a, a question about parks and then I'm going to get to wastewater as I'm sure you knew that was coming. So first of all, I'm very excited. Uh, we have Montgomery Bell State Park in Dixon County. It's a huge part of our local economy, brings people in from all over the country. It, we're very proud of it. Um, and the people of Lewis County are absolutely excited about Devil's Backbone and the investment that's going to go on there. My question is this, for the four parks that we're talking about investing and creating, what are we talking about size-wise as far as acreage? And is any of the money that's in the budget for acquiring additional acreage? <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Barrett. Um, so acreage on Middle Fork, Devil's Backbone, um, North Chickamauga Gorge, and uh, Scott's Gulf Wilderness Park, very widely. To start with Devil's Backbone that you mentioned, there are, it's about a um, 1,500 acres total with about with several of that on the west side of the Natchez Trace and several of that on the east side. And, and um, in terms of like strategic land acquisition, we feel like we have the land right now there that can be used to establish a great park. Um, the land on the west side is already established as a state natural area, so it has another layer of protection on it. The land on the east side it does not have that layer of protection. So our game plan right now, without a whole lot of details yet as we get into this, as we're just getting into this, is to put the amenities essentially on the east side of the Natchez Trace, preserving that state natural area designation on the west side. So that's the basic game plan for um, Devil's Backbone. Middle Fork Bottoms, um, is uh, also that kind of hundreds of acres size. Now the other two parks, um, Scott's Gulf, uh, uh, Scott's Gulf is several thousands of acres. All right, and North Chickamauga uh, Creek Gorge is about nine thousand acres. So very different kind of experiences are going to be available in those two, uh, in, in in those four state parks. Um, and you know our staffing plan relates in part to the activities as well as to the amount of acres uh, that'll be on those parks. And I hope that. And I, I would questions. add Greer on the, on the middle fork bottoms, there is a visitor center that'll be there and Scott's okay. golf. There is a visitor center that will be at those locations. Those will be more parking lot improvements, a uh, ranger contact station restrooms. Representative Barrett. So, so again, just to clarify, the, the, the budget proposal that we have does not include any additional land acquisition. We're just talking about capital improvements and staffing for making sure that we have the people for that to staff those parks. Exactly, for those four parks, Representative. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Representative Barrett? All right. Deputy Commissioner. Yes, sir. You know that, that wastewater is an issue in my district. Yes, sir. And I was very pleased to hear you address that in, in your opening statement about this idea of investing in larger regional wastewater districts. I think we're already seeing that, that there, there are tons of upside benefits that come with that, but there are also some cons that come along with it. So, and Commissioner Ely's been very patient in the back, but I'm glad he's here to hear this question because these things also interact. When, when we start going into rural areas and developing out infrastructure for wastewater, that's going to bring, obviously, growth that comes along with that. At least that's the idea, right? And so what my concern is, what, what, what we see happening in my district is the ramifications of what happens when you, you invest this type of uh, infrastructure in an area that's not prepared for it. They don't have the transportation infrastructure. They don't have the school infrastructure. They don't have police and fire and the whole nine yards that comes along with rapid, with rapid housing growth and industrial growth. You also, when you're talking about regionalizing these wastewater plants, you're talking about crossing county lines. Mm. Um, and Chairman Whitson is back here. So this, you know, 
we, we share this common issue when it comes to wastewater and, and, and trying to deal with this. So when it, does the department have a plan in place for rules or is this something that that's going to have to come back to, to the legislature to address what happens when we develop out these, these regional wastewater facilities uh, as far as how they're managed locally um, mm -hmm. how the different counties that are involved when you have different county governments and, and local governments that are involved, what say so they're going to have and how that impacts their community and how those, those entities are then managed down the road. Cause really that's what it, what it, where the rubber meets the road is if this has to happen and it, and it has to be built in order to take care of the citizens, let's figure out how we're going to manage it down the road. So if you can just, I know it's a lot packed into <laughs> uh, the, into this. If you can just kind of lightly address that. And then really, like I said, is, is there going to be some working relationship with your department and the part and the other departments like transportation and education that, that will be affected by what happens here? Thank you. No, th thank you, representative. Um, and, uh, understand, uh, the situation, the concerns, and, and appreciate your leadership on those, and um, and uh, look forward to working through those. Uh, to your first question about do, do we need laws or do we have rules, I, I would say yes with respect to rules. I think there are rules that uh, take uh, factors like growth and um, uh, socioeconomic considerations into account. Um, that focus on uh, really what is called the area of the waters is is where and and the waters cross county lines and so uh, that is a, a a regulatory mechanism that we currently have to try to evaluate those circumstances. Um, I, I should also note that um, while we do recognize that. Um, Growth is an important part of us continuing to be, uh, you know, one of the best states in the nation to locate a business, things like that. Um, I think that the, that our governor wants us to find a way to balance that economic prosperity with conservation of what is uniquely Tennessee. And so there are some areas that we have to take more things like that into account. And so um, through that uh, socioeconomic um, uh, analysis, we are able to uh, weave those concepts into um, our regulatory framework. Um, I don't know that I'm hitting on all of your questions because they were a lot packed into that, Representative. Can you remind me of, of one or two more so I can hit on, hit on them? Representative. Uh, again, just thinking forward thinking with yes. when when you all formulate um, a plan for going into an area and, and developing out a regional wastewater system, yep. then how is that going? Are, are you going to work with the Department of Transportation and other so that we're not reacting to what happens when when these investments are made, but we're we've got a proactive plan in place and we're ready for the, the ramifications that come down the pike from it? Yes, sir. So with respect to being forward thinking, um, we think it is absolutely paramount to um, work with the um, local water um, suppliers, withdrawers as much more of a resource instead, instead of our regulator hat. In, in other words, we want to try to facilitate that collaboration um, that, that can come through incentivizing working together. And through that, we do not, the state, we do not think that TDEC needs to be in the position of saying we're picking you as the winner, we're picking you as the winner for different water providers. Well, we think our role is best served in facilitating that collaboration. So that's how we approach it from a forward thinking perspective, work with um, uh, watershed groups that may exist uh, that, you know, have different local governments that are part of them, uh, different water providers. Uh, when it comes to working with w other infrastructure components, because that's a big part of growth is managing that infrastructure, we learned some really valuable lessons in West Tennessee when it comes to Blue Oval City. 
Um, and what I can tell you is that the, the governor's office does have a task force. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to be meeting right now. But um, And so there is definitely coordination among the agencies to ensure that as we have areas in the state that are growing, that we are uh, collaborating, sharing information, and looking for ways to um, work together. And, and so far, so good. We've, uh, you know, we've learned a lot from the Blue Oval City experience. Representative Barrett. Thank you. I, I appreciate the answer, I, and I look forward to working with you as well. I mean, it, you, sir. it's an important thing for my district. Um, you know, as you know, there's two sides of every coin, and yes, both, both sides have a, a very valid reason for for being on that side of the coin and so i appreciate your work and your staff's you. work and, and for good lord's sake can we please get representative whitson a park in williamson county i don't know if his county is going to survive without a state park <laughs> uh, we, we, we don't uh, have a prison oh i'm sorry mr chairman chairman <laughs> may <laughs> As heard earlier, we do have some local park uh, uh, grant funds that are available that we could. Uh... Thank you, Commissioner. We'll, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> and, and Chairman, if I may, uh, also being from your area at Neck of the Woods, I know that uh, that historical conservation uh, preservation component will be really important. And I'm hearing some good things coming from the Heritage Conservation Trust Fund. Sticking on the water and wastewater uh 1.35 billion if you if you want to look it up it's uh, that has been received uh through federal funds through the department can you talk a little bit about what the department has done with those funds sure be be more than happy to uh and uh you know when we look at our state and we really look at the infrastructure needs as is i don't think it's with uh, the anticipated economic growth that we're experiencing right now but we have about 15 billion dollars of needs projected through 2040 uh, so the, the 1.35 billion that came down through the America rescue plan, uh, uh, dollars, uh, that was, uh, uh, dedicated, that was dedicated toward drinking water and wastewater infrastructure improvements. So, so we've, uh, we've gone through and we've developed a program, I, I think in, in pretty record time in working with, uh, the water infrastructure advisory committee, which is made up of utility districts, large operators, small operators, uh, member from Senate, member from House, uh, other other interested parties, pretty broad view. And then we have the Fiscal Stimulus Accountability Group, which is made up of the Governor, Commissioner of Finance and Administration, uh, the Deputy Governor, Butch Ely, back here behind me, I think still attends those. The Governor, uh, as I noted, Lieutenant Governor, Speaker, the uh, Madam Chair uh, Hazelwood, uh, uh, the Chair, the Senate Chair of, uh, of Finance, uh, Chairman Watson. So it's a, it's a broad group and we work with them and come in and present to them as how we're going to organize. Uh, the first billion dollars was put out in non-competitive grants through formulas that were agreed to uh, through, through these different working groups and stakeholders. And so uh, that money went out November 1, or that was the deadline for applications for that. I know you probably can't believe it, but about 80% of those applications showed up the last two weeks of October. Uh, which put a huge strain on us, uh, and uh, but we did receive about nine hundred ninety million dollars in applications. They're going out the door very quickly, and I think all those contracts will be out the door. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say right at the end of March or the first couple weeks in April. Uh, then we move into the next phase, which are, are two hundred million dollars that will be going out for a competitive process, and they will be focused in certain areas. That'll move a lot quicker. Uh, just because it is a competitive process and the way that we're able to set it up, uh, whereas previously it had to go to municipalities, it had to go to, to counties, and uh, this is open to utility districts for making applications for those grants. So, so we anticipate all of that to be contracted by the end of this fiscal year, uh, maybe going into the first quarter of 2024. Nevertheless, that gives us we have to have all the money contracted by December 31st, 2024. All the money has to be spent by December 31st, 2026. So we feel like we're in pretty good shape right now with that. All right. Thank you very much, Chair Lady. Thank you. And I believe that concludes the questions. So um, 
thank you, Commissioner, and your team for being here for an extended period. Um, and we uh, really appreciate your time and the work that you do across the state. And I say again, we really, um, the state parks are sort of a crown jewel. So uh, thank you all and the park rangers and everyone that works every day to protect them and make sure that Tennesseans can enjoy them and enjoy them in a safe way. So thanks so much. We have another budget hearing this afternoon. That will be the Department of Transportation. I saw the commissioner here earlier. There he is. We're all on. told Bush he's the only thing between us and <laughs> Commissioner, welcome. And apologies for the wait. Uh, there's a, a lot of interest in uh, some things going on at TDEC, as you could tell. And I know there's nothing much going on in transportation that we haven't already <laughs> discussed. <laughs> so if um, you want to introduce your team and we'll get right underway. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Hazelwood and uh, members of the committee. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I know that uh, this is this is not my my first budget hearing, but it, el it, it is my first uh, budget hearing with Department of Transportation. So I'm grateful, grateful to be here in front of you today. Um, I've got our members uh, of our leadership team that will introduce themselves as, as uh, time goes on. But I, I also want to recognize the extraordinary 3,600 people that are also uh, with us uh, today in support of what we are doing that are day in, day out, working for Tennesseans, going above and beyond. So uh, certainly uh, appreciate appreciate all of them. Uh, this budget uh, today that you will see is certainly a consideration of our immediate uh, needs, but it also is a look to the future and a plan for the future as to how we get to to, to where we're headed in the, in the future. So uh, I know that, uh, I know y'all been here a long time, and so I'm going to keep keep my remarks short. I would just say that we are we are very uh, we, we're very lucky to be in the situation that we're in uh, with the assets that we have in Tennessee, but we also have challenges. We've got so many good things going for us, but the population growth, the growth in vehicle miles traveled, with our uh, recognition that. The revenue stream and our gas tax is is not sustainable in the long term. The age of our infrastructure, all of these things happening at the same time certainly are presenting challenges to us. And so uh, we're prepared to meet those today. Uh, obviously, we're we're focused on the budget side. And so uh, I am I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our CFO, Joe Gabato. But I, before I do that, I want to recognize one person who, um, who has devoted their life and career uh, to, uh, to this department, and that is our chief engineer, former chief engineer, Paul Deggs. Paul's with us here. Um, <laughs> given so much to us. I just want to make sure we recognize and acknowledge him. Joe? All right, Madam Chair, Committee. Uh, good afternoon. Joe Galvato, uh, Chief Financial Officer. So we'll go to our first slide. You, the, you've already gone past one here. And you're going back. There you go. So uh, we want to talk about our cost increases. Uh, as you all have been painfully aware, items one and two are from the Transportation Modernization Fund. And so we'll talk about that uh, further when you when you want us to. As far as the 6.5 million general fund transfer, that is um, a, a, an ongoing appropriation that you all are putting toward us. Remember that the uh, cap that any one aviation fuel user can pay 
dropped from 10.5 a million down to five. And so that makes up the 5.5. You also reduce the sales tax from 4.5% to 4.25%, which calculates to about a million. And that's why that recurring um, thing comes to us. As far as the six million to the transportation equity fund for air, you'll remember that we do an analysis to look at our general fund airports, and we need to keep them in a good state of uh, state of good repair. Uh, so we need fifty million dollars each year. So when we take the federal dollars from the IIJA, normal FAA dollars, normal split of the transportation equity fund, as well as that six point five split, there's a six million dollar differential, and that's why we need that for our general aviation airports. So let's talk really quickly about the variances in our budget It's uh, and our revenue side. So the federal will be up about $104 million. You'll remember when the IIJA came into play, there was about a $280 million thrust uh, to Tennessee. But as we go through each year, there's about a $20 million increase each year, somewhere around $23 million between fiscal 23 and 24. The remaining 80, $81 million variance is due to the fact that in fiscal 23, we did not have clarity on FAA funds for the general aviation airports, uh, some of the things for FTA, as well as some FAA resiliency funds. They're now included, and that makes up the difference. On the state side, the increase of $2.6 billion, again, $3.3 billion of that is going to be for the Transportation Modernization Act. Counteracting that would be the $719 million one-time general fund transfer that you all gave us last year. Remember, it was for things like economic development projects for Smith & Wesson, Eastman Chemical, Oracle. We had partnership programs. We had Improve Act uh, escalation. We had inter interchanges in rural areas and whatnot, so that will not reoccur. On the local side, uh, of the $17 million, $6 million will come from the Transportation Modernization Fund. So. Remember, with the state aid program, it's a 98%, 2% match for the locals. So the 300 million represents 98%, 6 million represents the 2% match. The other 11 million will come from the different types of federal projects that our locals will be responsible to pay for. All right, so this is our, our reasonability analysis that we bring to you each year. Obviously, especially for the finance committee, you wanna make sure that what we're putting forth for a budget looks reasonable. So the, the conclusion of this slide is it's reasonable, but I'll, I'll take you through so to give you a little more detail. I'll combine gas and diesel if you don't mind. Uh, if you can see between fiscal 21 and 22, gas went up about $20 million and diesel went up about 11. Now, when we look at fiscal 23's budget, <clears throat> that's fine, but we actually do a forecast. Our forecast today shows that fiscal 22 and fiscal 23 will be almost equivalent. So when you look at gas, if it was 529 last year, it looks like 529 again this year. Going to 523 next year looks a little bit conservative from the funding board, but that's counteracted on the diesel side, where the 235 this year will repeat itself this year, next last year will repeat itself this year, and then going up 245 looks a little bit aggressive to us, but again net net they should be fine. The special petroleum fee at 38 to 39 million is is uh, is fine right now. Vehicle registration, you remember that there was a vehicle registration holiday that you all passed last year in fiscal 23. We don't expect that to reoccur, so that's why fiscal 24 is going back. On the beer and bottle tax, again, we take about 13% of the beer tax, about 21% of the bottlers tax, and that seven, eight million reoccurs every year. And on the transportation equity fund, you can see that the funding board has changed fiscal 24 up because you could see a nice increase in fiscal 22. And again, that looks reasonable. So we had a couple discussion things that we wanted to put forth before we entertain questions. On the state of good repair, we, we wanna be very, very strong here, especially in finance. Our state of good repair is very important. We moved uh, as, a, as a ranking from number four in the nation and in our infrastructure to number eight. And so we need to keep uh, investing in our uh, state of good repair. In 2020, we invested $360 million. This year that we're in, we will not invest $360 million. We'll invest $460 million. And next year, our new chief engineer believes that we are still not uh, coming up to snuff. So we will go from 460 to 520 next year. So we are putting our money where our mouth is. 
we are fixing it first, and those are the first dollars we take off the top. On road fatalities, we are concerned uh, in 2018, 1,040 people, 1040, died on our roads. Last year, 1,324 people died on our roads, and that's unacceptable. We have four, the four E's that they talk about, engineering, enforcement, education, and emergency response. So the people at TDOT designing roads, our THP and local enforcement trying to stop people from speeding, our education coming from the transportation, from the um, Tennessee Highway Safety Office, as well as our first responders, everybody is pulling very, very hard. But the problem that we have is we have so many distracted drivers with the cell phones. We have people who are impaired with drugs or alcohol. And then the, the number one killer is the speed. So we're concerned with all that. We're doing all we can, but it's something that everyone should be aware of. Commissioner, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I would, I would just uh, point out um, that we are we're really moving toward uh, trying to think outside the box, and we recognize that uh, just more more paving and and more bridges does not solve the entire problem. Uh, as, as you said, Representative Barry, earlier, we've got to work together to look at all of our infrastructure and work with our partners. Uh, so we really see uh, our our looking at a total infrastructure solution, looking at how we improve also uh, bringing in elements of transit, bringing in elements of aviation and water as part of the overall transportation solution for our state. Uh, the other thing I would point out um, earlier, I talked about the age of infrastructure. Most of our bridges were, uh, were built in the 60s and 70s. Uh, most of our infrastructure was built in the 60s and 70s. And so we're continuing to have that challenge of how the aging of that infrastructure is now catching up with us. And so that's part of the governor's uh, over, overall plan to be able to modernize what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, one thing I would point out with the, uh, the leveraging here is that while we're, while the governor's recommended three billion dollars as part of his budget uh 3.3 including the state aid program that uh that joe talked about um that is also uh if you will um leveraging those dollars because with the public private partnerships that we will take on to do uh, some of these improvements that we're talking about with choice lanes then we're going to be able to reallocate the dollars that we would have spent on those to be able to put into expanding many of our original interstate, two-lane interstates that we all know uh, need to be expanded. And so uh, there's a lot of additional uh, dollars that that three billion will end up contributing overall to what we're actually able to do in more improvements uh, for Tennesseans. And, and the last thing I would add uh, with with EPIC and IPD, which EPIC um, and IPD is stands for what we're trying to do differently in our department now to be able to uh, em empower our, our folks and improve uh, our, our culture and uh, do things differently and faster. And one of that, one of those things we're doing is making sure that we're taking care of our uh, existing employees, current employees. And um, as you know, we are facing, as really all of our apartments in, uh, in Tennessee now, difficulty with workforce, recruitment, retention, being able to make sure that we keep the good employees that we have. And so what we're going to uh, be doing as part of this budget is, is uh, taking 500 current vacancies and putting those back into the budget. Um, I'll point out that those are vacancies, not filled positions. So there's uh, no one currently uh, working in an apartment that uh, will, will not have a position. These are uh, purely vacancies, but we're going to, we're going to take those dollars around $35 million as a result of that and invest those dollars back into those employees. Uh, we've got a number of people, frontline workers, who are still um, not making anywhere near the current market salaries that 
uh, that their counterparts in other uh, areas of, of uh, are making. And so we're going to invest those back in to make sure we're taking care of current employees. With that, um, Chair Hazelwood, I will stop and uh, entertain any questions that you have. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, first of all, I want to commend you on repurposing, if you will, um, those jobs and using those dollars in a way to make your department function better and a way to reward people who are, have worked really hard and um, kept the wheels in Tennessee turning. I also want to commend your department. It's something that we don't often see here. Uh, we, I wish we saw it more frequently, but not only reallocating uh, vacant positions, but also addressing from the low end up. Um, I think too often what we've seen with additional dollars that have gone to departments, the dollars have gotten stopped on the way down and the folks at the bottom level haven't really seen uh, the impact that, that they probably deserve to have. So I, I really do, I can't say loudly enough in um, how grateful I am and how I, I really think that's, that's the best way to run a railroad and I congratulate you on, on doing that. With that love fest, I will move to uh, <laughs> Representative Lynn for the first question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for being with us. And thank you to all the employees at TDOT. You all do a wonderful job. Um, my question is about Blue Oval City. In October of 21, TDOT was appropriated $200 million for projects concerning Blue Oval City, specifically for road construction from State Road 194, from State Road 59 to State Road 1, an interchange at I-40 and a connector road at State Road 222. Can the department provide an update on the megasite project? And is the $200 million sum sufficient to complete this project in 2021 when the cost for this construction project were estimated was inflation, um, you know, accounted for in uh, the to the degree that yes. we've seen it uh, happen and uh, what percentage was factored and have there been any changes to the original design which may cause increases in the project yes so that's a mouthful <laughs> <laughs> yes thank you representative uh, and i appreciate the question and i'm gonna i'm gonna take a shot at high level and then i'm gonna turn over to will reed our our um, chief engineer but um, on a high level since those original uh, estimations were made and since we started talking with uh, Ford, we, we worked very collaboratively to uh, determine that they actually were more interested in speeding things up um, on the interchange that was already there, which uh, is adjoining 222. Um, as part of that property. And so we have worked very closely with them over the last year to make sure that we're trying to fulfill what they need to be able to get up and running in a, in a, in a, in a time period that they need. And I would tell you that, uh, that everything is on target for doing that in a time frame that they need to be able to do that. And so um, I will, and, and depending upon how we end up being, I think we'll end up spending less on the original new interchange that we thought that we needed the 200 million for, and we may spend more on the other 242 interchange that is already there along with improvements on 222. But I think we'll all, all fall out at the end, uh, close. We're still working on that. Um, we'll, I'll let you add to that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Will Reed, Chief Engineer. I, I would echo the Commissioner's comments. It's it's a little bit of a different project than than what we started with, but uh, thankfully we've been able to adapt to that, and we have seen escalation in costs just due to, you know, the nationwide trends that everybody is seeing. But um, as he pointed out, we've, we work very closely with Ford. Uh, they are, at this point, they, they are um, satisfied that we are on pace to to meet their uh, their opening dates. Overall, the project's going going very well. However, it is um, Commissioner pointed out that the the original 
project design contemplated a much more significant interchange at, at mile marker 39 than what is actually going to go in. But that is, um, it is all working well because we're working in conjunction with the engineers at Ford to make sure that their needs are met. So it truly is a team effort. I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm proud of my team at TDOT that has been able to, frankly, improvise and adapt to be able to, uh, to answer the bell with regard to such a big investment. So they have done well. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. In your 23-24 budget, there was $6 million that was put in in non-recurring funds. Um, and it was for the local airport authorities. Can you give us a brief uh, summation of what that money is going to go for? Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, so the $6 million is when we do our analysis of the general aviation airports and what those 71 airports need to keep the state of good repair, it costs about $50 million per year. And so what we do when we talk to FNA to keep it at $50 million, we don't have enough money to do that. But when we take the FAA normal money, add it to the IIJ, IIJA money that we receive and to the other state money, there was a $6 million shortfall and that's what we're using it for. It's mainly used um, representative for pavement preservation, for taxiways, runways, um, as well as the terminals, hangars and things like that. And the amount of money we give in the uh, reduction in the uh, air aviation fuel, I guess is what it's called, uh, the avi aviation fuel, has that caused any problems or have we seen any negative from that or has it all been good? Well, it, it, you know, it's actually, it, for us, it, it's it's a wash. Uh, when you all did that, when you when you decreased the cap from 10 and a half to 5 million, and decrease the sales tax from 4.5 to 4.25. Yes, it decreased money going to us, but as a general fund recurring uh, infusion, you're continuing to give us and make us whole on the 6.5 million. So we're appreciative of that. So there's no chance of us getting to see an increase in those revenues probably there. Uh, the only time you see an increase, you actually, on the transportation equity fund for air, you actually, it's a good question. We actually did see an increase. So all things being equal, we would have thought the transportation equity fund in fiscal 22 would have dropped. And it, in, but what you do in finance, you do a rate volume analysis and the rate did cause the collections to go down about one to $2 million. But what happened last year, which no one expected, 20% more gallons were sold in aviation fuel and they all cost 50% more. And so that volume increase caused, you know, a 12 to $14 million increase in collections netting out to the 12 million increase year over year. So, um, you know, the only way we, we do better is when more gallons are sold. I mean, uh, but I, I, Chairman Crawford, I would just add one quick thing to that. And that goes back to, uh, the comments earlier about the cost of maintaining the airports, uh, general aviation airports that we have, you know, Tasser did a study, uh, we did a study, um, that indicated that we needed in that uh, $50 million range, we've got 72 of those general aviation airports. And so to be able to invest, keep those up to the current level of service, that's not increasing the level of service, that's maintaining the current level of service that we have, that uh, that's, that's the dollar amount needed. And so what this represents is a total of being able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wasn't expecting that. You caught me off guard. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, uh, I've got two questions, two things to, to ask, and I'll try to make this quick because we're all hungry. Um, in, in, your, in your discussion items about state of good repair, and, and you mentioned the bridges that are aging, built back in the 60s, one of the things that, that we've experienced in our district, and I'm sure you're seeing this all over the state, with the use of corrugated metal pipes that are now reaching the end of their 50-year life cycle and are collapsing all over the place, is there any type of 
like ARPA grant or anything built into this budget or anywhere, anything that you have planned to try to get some sort of fund put together to be able to address this? Because it's going to be an ongoing issue over the next several years. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Representative. Uh, it is definitely going to be a challenge. And that's, as we said, uh, I think we're going to continue to see more and more of our overall program going to state of good repair and that's the term that we use but it really comes boils down to maintaining what you got and so that's that's going to continue to be a bigger and bigger portion of, of what we're responsible to do will do you have any comments you want to add to that yeah, yeah i would just say representative i appreciate the question um my colleagues here know how much i uh care about uh funding state of good repair and keeping our good assets in good condition. We actually started a pipe inventory program a couple of years ago uh, across the st state. It started in one of our district offices where um, we have an ongoing effort to inventory every single every single pipe and side drain across the state that that we can find out about. Frankly, there are some out there that we still didn't even know that we had until uh, recently, and are systematically trying to replace those as funds become avail available. But to that larger question, that's that's one of those things that we we plan for off the top. We take money off the top before we go and build new projects, and and those costs just continue to go up. But we feel like it's a priority that we want to put dollars towards. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you for that. You know, I think you guys are aware of the Dixon's falling in with sinkholes everywhere that aren't sinkholes, but it, it's it's not unique to our area. So I appreciate that you all have a plan in place for that. I want to talk a little bit about Blue Oval and how you, when you drop a pebble in the middle of the pond, it ripples. Well, Blue Oval is not a pebble. It's a boulder. And I'm on the west side of my district, Dixon County, Hickman County, with that side of I-40. Um, most people are aware of the Bermuda Triangle. I think you guys probably are aware of the Bucksnort Triangle, which had another wreck today that shut down I-40 East coming in. If it's gonna, if it's bad and it's gonna happen on I-40 West, it's gonna happen around Bucksnort. Hmm. So, that being said, a lot we got huge areas of rural interstates in Tennessee, including that one, that are being serviced with emergency responders that are volunteer fire departments or rescue squads. And when we start investing in things like Blue Oval, that's going to put more trucks on the road that are carrying hazardous materials. We've got a fuel depot now in Dixon County that's bringing more and more uh, fuel trucks on I-40. Is there a plan in place to deal with emergency response and investing in that, and particularly in the rural parts of our interstate, so that the, the people are being serviced by, by professionals that have the equipment necessary to deal with those types of issues? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Representative Barrett. So first, first I, I, I got pictures of that, that early <laughs> early that incident that you're talking about and and you're correct i mean we we see that a lot on i-40 so i i just i i have to say that that is a big part i know we're focused on budget here but it's a big part of the governor's modernization act that we're talking about because the dollars that we're talking about being able to leverage are are going to also be able to be spent on expanding a lot of our existing two-lane interstates that are out there today. I know I've heard from many of you, and you know well that being able, that's a huge part of the safety consideration that we're trying to do, being able to get these interstates into three lanes or, or to the appropriate amount of laneage that needs to be there to be able to avoid some of these accidents that are occurring. Uh, our folks do a great job on incident response. You want to respond to that? Thank you, Commissioner. I, I just want to say there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot of things that are behind um, behind your question. I, I agree. I know that that area fairly well, and there are uh, a lot of incidents there. So you've got you've got the engineering aspect of having rural interstates with high speeds. Um, but the other thing uh, the commissioner mentioned is we our our operation staff, our maintenance maintenance and construction staff actually respond to incidents now. Currently, it's part of the duties that they that they have. Um, now, if in situations where there's critical injuries or 
uh, or fatalities, then there it takes on a whole whole nother role or a hazardous materials uh, situation. But they respond to those those issues now. Um, the other thing that that we are talking about internally expanding is uh, we've seen in other states is a rural service patrol that's similar to some some folks would call it help light. You've seen the help trucks in our urban areas, and those are uh, one of our most successful programs. Uh, we're looking at, at what would it take to expand that in our rural areas, but also the technology piece. You know, one of the things that that helps us in the urban areas is we have eyes on on those sections of roadway that help us identify. Uh, issues quickly and uh, mobilize those resources. That's one of the things that we need to consider on sections of rural interstate. We have some rural ITS projects in the mill. Again, this is this is one of those things where when the if the funds are available to to implement those strategies, I think that we could we could definitely see a benefit in uh, safety to the traveling public. Thank you. I appreciate it. Leader Camper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, I appreciate your uh, your presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear all of this conversation about Blue Oval City, because I think it's really going to be an opportunity to really just transform West Tennessee. And with that, I do feel like some of my colleagues that we're really going to have to think about, you know, what does infrastructure look like? in West Tennessee and how do we move people from, you know, Lake and O'Brien down to the site, Henry, you know, Magnary, Shelby, how do we move everyone in and out? So I think we have an enormous opportunity before us. Uh, I know the governor have a proposal for his um, transportation modernization. And I know you and I have talked before about doing an entire um, study on the region because we have got to be getting in front of this. And, and I feel that the department is doing all, it's can, all it can to, in fact, get in front of it. Uh, but I also feel like um, with the Transportation Modernization Act, we have another opportunity before us, you know. Uh, and it's been a lot of talk about the choice lanes and all of that. And, and we'll talk about that, I guess, when we get to the bill. But um, I'm wondering if the department has taken time to um, think about, you know, how how are we going to move all of these people? Uh, we we don't have light rail, um, you know what you you know, and I know you're thinking about it. I just would like to hear some insights because I think the opportunity is before us and it's enormous, and I think we can really, you know, uh, do something about it. Thank you, Leader. Uh, and first of all, I agree. I agree with you totally. Uh, I think this is a huge opportunity. And when we think about the impact that it has on West Tennessee and all of our counties, in the uh, you know the ability to get our people who are anxious for uh, uh, new opportunities, it, the, being able to get to that site and be able to uh, have jobs uh, is critical. And so. We're, that is uh, foremost, we are, we're meeting, I know that uh, Commissioner Sawyers mentioned earlier uh, during his presentation that we're meeting on a monthly basis as a group of commissioners together, uh, looking at how we help each other, how we coordinate with each other, how we, how we accomplish uh, what is possible uh, on that site and, and as helping our Tennesseans on that. One thing I'd like I'd like Preston to hit on is because we've had this conversation about um, l looking at, at transit, looking at getting yes. people from 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 Memphis and other places yes. to the site. Yeah, uh, Preston Elliott, Chief of Environment and Planning. Uh, very good question. Uh, we've actually been working on a study uh, around the Blue Oval. It's a ten county uh, study looking at transportation opportunities as it relates to the development, being able to look at the, the workforce uh, opportunities that exist and how they can best get to, to Blue Oval. 
um, uh, everything from looking at van pooling to to uh, uh, transportation demand management types of strategies, also exploring different transit options, everything from passenger rail, light rail, uh, to express type bus services. So we recognize that there's a, 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 a great opportunity for employment and how best to get those individuals to that facility. And so transit and transportation alternatives that, uh, as I've mentioned, are the fastest and easiest way of, um, of doing that quickly. Um, we are about halfway through that study. Uh, we'll have some public meetings coming up here in the next uh, month and a half. Uh, and uh, we, again, we've, we, the study includes not only Shelby County, mm -hmm. but in the surrounding counties that you mentioned as well to the north, but all the way over to Madison as well. So we're looking at it from, from Memphis to, to Jackson as an example of trying to make sure we best understanding uh, opportunities as it relates to that site. If I could just back up a little bit, just to give a little bit greater context, uh, currently there's about $200 million annually in our budget uh, for transit statewide. Of that, about 77 million is state dollars. Um, about 30, about 26 million of that's used to match federal funds that go to our transit agencies. There's another 30 million in um, operating assistance, and then we have about 21 million that we make available for uh, capital investments. Uh, MATA is, is a great example; takes advantage of that with their bus rapid transit project on the innovation corridor, as an example. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> now, thank you, Madam Chair. Later, now you know how this works, right? <laughs> uh, just, just a quick question. I, I know this is budget hearings and House Bill three twenty one. We will get into more details about the the three point three billion dollars, which is a major investment. But going back to the seven hundred and fifty million dollars in four parts. That's to cover. How does geographically that breaks down? Yeah, let me let me let me take a shot at that. Uh, so so the three three hundred the three hundred three point three goes to the state aid fund that is distributed the way that we have always distributed uh, to the counties, and so that'll be the same way that we that we have historically. The the three billion, uh, I, I think, takes into account the fact that the that the governor has said. He wants to make sure that all of Tennessee is able to benefit as a result of these dollars from, from Memphis to, to Bristol and everywhere in between both urban and rural. And so what we have said is that is that we would we would distribute that equally uh, among the regions that we have. We have four, we're organized in four regions within TDOT. And so that's where the 750 comes from. But I would I would point out that uh, as, as Chairman Howell uh, has uh, b before to his committee, that um, that's kind of a baseline because what we're looking at doing with the the three billion is using that as the impetus to be able to do these public-private partnerships, so that the private sector will come in and actually invest dollars into improving these uh, interstates or congested areas that will actually allow us to free up others of other of that three billion dollars as well as a portion of our existing revenue stream to be able to do other projects that right now we can't do we've talked about in this committee and and others about the the pie right. and so what you know what we're talking about doing is expanding the pie and so the 750 is kind of a, a, a minimum, I would say, and, and and I think every region will will be able to uh, take advantage of at least that much. And then, as we proceed forward in the years to come, you know, we'll continue to to uh, prioritize and do as much as we can do with those funds. Madam Chair, thank you, Commissioner, for that. So let's say that seven hundred fifty million, and and once it's established. Last question in reference or statement, Blue Oval. But but let's say once a, a partnership is, is formed there, would Choice Lanes be a part of that conversation or could be? I I, I can't imagine Choice Lanes uh, in in that area it's, itself. I mean, it typically is going to be a function of 
congestion and volume. Um, and so the, the choice lanes themselves uh, are going to be the ones that are most economically feasible, feasible. to create the volume of revenue to pay for themselves. Okay. I mean, and so you're going to see that in our most urbanized areas. Okay. But what that's going to do is free up those other dollars uh, that are going uh, through that to be able for us to use on other projects that currently wouldn't be able to be done, including expanding our interstates that are now two lane to three lane. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you um, and your team for being here. I know it's, the road builders have been on the hill today, <laughs> as, as you well know, and it's mind boggling. We, we keep talk. I keep saying that a billion dollars just doesn't go as far as it used to. And in talking with the road builders, they're telling me a lane mile now is basically $10 million. So even with a $3 billion, $3.3 billion infusion, if you divide that by $10 million, uh, you know, we're not going to be paving the state. So um, we, it's a start, but I, I, everyone needs to understand. And that's, that's the cost today. And inflation is continuing to escalate. So um, by this time next year, I'm sure it might be significantly more. So again, another reason that we have to rethink the way that we fund our roads in Tennessee. So thank you for being forward thinking on that and um, bringing us some options that hopefully will keep Tennesseans moving and keep us uh, out of all those traffic jams. We all just want a choice line direct to our house. That's, <laughs> that's all we would ask of the department. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. Thank you, Chair Hazelwood. Members, you, that concludes our budget hearings for today. Oh, we're back in session. We have concluded our budget hearings at 8 o'clock in the morning, members. We will have our last budget hearings. So be here. See you then. We are adjourned. <laughs> are we still just meeting in the back? <laughs>